Hello, my friends, Grim here. I hope you are well today. Thank you for joining me for this video, which is part two of a three-part series on the Fanaticism Zealot Paladin. In part one, if you missed it, go check it out, because we talked at great length about all of his gear, including a detailed breakdown of all of these small charms in the inventory. Here in part two today, we will be talking about everything else you need to know, including but not limited to skills, stats, and the mercenary. In part three to follow soon, it will be a very thorough gameplay video, so make sure you stay tuned for that, give us a thumbs up if you like this type of content, and without any further ado, let's talk about the build beginning with skills. All right, guys, so there are three skills which are non-negotiable, must max outs. The first one is Zeal, which is your left click, or perhaps E or something else if you're using Quick Cast. And that is not only the namesake skill, but it is the primary attack. It is boosting your attack rating and your damage in a very satisfying type of way, not only in terms of how the numbers scale up, but also in terms of the animation. Anyone who's ever played a Zealot knows exactly what I'm talking about. And the primary aura is fanaticism, and that is going to increase attack speed and attack rating for you and your party, making you a friend to physical damage dealers the world over. The third skill is not one that we will really ever use once we're in the end game. although while leveling, if you choose to level as a zealot, you might actually get some mileage out of it, is sacrifice, and sacrifice is very simple. It scales with zeal, synergizes with it to the tune of an additional 12% damage per level, granted to our primary damage dealing skill. Don't really need to explain that one any further, now do I? The next skill in order of priority is Holy Shield. Now, this is an iconic paladin skill for a very, very good reason. It's going to give you significant bonuses to blocking above all, but also to smite damage and to defense and duration as well. Now, you can take one of two approaches with Holy Shield in this particular build. Number one is to do what I did and max it out, just like you maxed out Zeal, sacrifice and fanaticism or at least come very very close to doing so as you can see i have 18 base points in here it is functionally maxed out you do start reaching diminishing returns of course after a time which is why you can take another approach and put just enough points in it to make the duration decent so you're not constantly having to re-up it and to reach max blocking chance but in order to reach max blocking chance and kind of min-max holy shield in that pursuit, you'll need to really be on point with your endgame shield's native blocking chance and how many points you have in dexterity and all of that other stuff. So given the fact that the excess points beyond the core of zeal, fanaticism, sacrifice, and X number of points into holy shield are relatively flexible and relatively superfluous in this build, I personally am comfortable maxing or near maxing Holy Shield. But that is, it at the end of the day, up to you, and there are some other interesting things you can do with your points. Let's talk about those real quick before we move on. So with these extra points, I'd like to begin by talking about the one-ofs, sometimes like Holy Bolt and Blessed Hammer. By the time you're at the end game, you don't use those. They are mere prereqs for stuff like Holy Shield, but other prereqs are actually very useful. Smite can be very effective in certain situations. For example, boss fights, especially if your attack rating isn't where you would like it to be. And charge, even though you only put one point into it, and you would put one point into it even if you were teleporting just to unlock Holy Holy Shield is actually your primary mobility skill, and it's very, very useful. It's really fun, actually, zooming around the map with some good old charging. Definitely a fun time for the whole family. Now, the final combat skill I have a point in is Vengeance, and I actually highlight this in order to show you that it is an option, but I do not recommend it. 
if and when I next respec with this character, I will not be putting this point into Vengeance. It's useful in kind of the mid-game, maybe even early stage late game when you are not quite breaking physical immunities or generally farming against high defense opponents as much as you would like. And in those particular situations, a point into Vengeance can give you an alternative avenue of attack. Of course, it's doing fire, lightning, and cold damage. The problem is, by the time you get to the end game, which we are A, you're breaking physical immunes with your mercenary quite consistently, and B, you, when you do encounter those like stone skin physical immunes, they're often immune to one of these sources of damage anyway. So between that immunity crippling Vengeance's damage and the fact that it's a one point wonder, it's really not something I would recommend for the end game, even though it is useful at times for leveling this character. In the offensive auras tree, we just have some prereqs leading up to our main aura, of course, of fanaticism. And then, in the defensive auras tree, we have unlocked Vigor, which is useful for moving around town more quickly since you are not allowed to charge in town. Never mind that you save the world many times over. They don't want you charging in town. It's going to, like, knock over the tables in the tavern or something. Whatever. We'll comply with the law, right? But Vigor helps you move around town a whole lot quicker, and it might not seem worth the point right? But it actually adds up over time if you're going for min-max efficiency and all that type of stuff. For example, if you're doing Travancall runs, you're starting all the way back at the docks every time you load a new game. So you turn on Vigor under the waypoint and then switch back to Fanaticism or Charge to get to the council before you turn Fanaticism back on. So Vigor actually makes you more efficient in the long run. It is worth the investment if you ask me. You're also unlocking some stuff that can be kind of useful in various situations, mostly for party play, but cleansing is probably the best from among them. Cleansing, getting rid of poisoning and, and curses can be really nice. Prayer, of course, and defiance as well are options, but really what you'll be doing, besides potentially maxing Holy Shield and getting some one-point wonders, is putting the remainder of your points into Resist Fire and or Resist Lightning. Resist Lightning is the more common one, but as you can see, Resist Fire is usable too. I actually have two points into that, and base that is, and 13 base into Resist Lightning. So when you look at your resistance caps, you see some odd numbers with this build. Right now I'm at 86 over capped for max fire and 91 over capped for lightning resist. Now, part of that comes from items like Fortitude and Phoenix, but part of it also comes from the passive attributes of resist lightning and resist fire, which even when they are not equipped, increase the maximum cap to their respective elements by basically one point for every two hard points that go into it. As to which one you should pick, well, Lightning is notorious from Gloams, which can be dangerous otherwise, and Resist Fire, of course, helps against the aforementioned Traven Call. Which ones you should use depends on your exact gear choices, but if you're following my build in this video to a T, I would recommend getting a couple points into Resist Fire, focusing more on Lightning, and then kind of maybe alternating between the two as you go, but really, I'm at level 94, I don't really need any more points in either one of these. Maybe I'll finish maxing Holy Shield by the time I'm 96. Who knows? And if you're wondering why not resist cold, well, number one, cold damage in the broad world of D2 is probably the least scary for a character like this from among cold, fire, and lightning. And then on top of that, we're all using Raven Frost on this build. The fact that it gives you cannot be frozen and cold absorb plus 20% means that we have even less to fear from cold damage than we otherwise would. So just to review the skills, guys, we've got max out zeal, and maxing its Synergy Skill Sacrifice, we are also maxing Fanaticism, of course unlocking those with all the necessary prereqs along the way. With Holy Shield, you can either put a handful of points into it, just enough to have a decent duration and to reach max blocking chance, or you can go all the way to maxing it out, or very near to doing so. Besides that, you want a few different one-point wonders, and the rest of your points are going to go into Resist Fire and or Resist Lightning, depending on your exact resistance needs. 
Now as for your baseline stats, this may not satisfy some of you, but this is my honest and authentic opinion on how to stat a zealot, and that is that it doesn't matter as much as you probably think, and it certainly doesn't matter as much as it does for a caster, for example. With many, many caster characters, you are going to want no points into energy, just enough strength and dexterity, the very minimum possible to wear your gear, and every other available point goes into vitality. Now, that is actually a viable way to stat the Zealot, but it has, is at kind of an extreme end of the survivability spectrum. And it's not even strictly better for survivability purposes if you are not reaching max block. So, the idea as a baseline is of course you've got to have enough dex and strength to wear your gear, of course, you've got to also have enough decks to hit max block and make sure you are casting, of course, Holy Shield before you take that measurement and calculate exactly how many stat points you need. And of course, you don't want anything into energy beyond the base that the Paladin comes with. But it's actually totally fine to have more points than minimum into decks and more points than minimum into strength, and it's for the very simple reason that dexterity is going to increase your attack rating. As you can see, even with all of my endgame gear and everything else, we are, well, I guess when I, when I turn Fanaticism Aura on, we're at 95% chance to hit the decade. I thought I was going to have a 90% chance to show you how I have room to grow, and I do. It's just against different enemies that are harder to hit, especially bosses, you'll see the attack rating giving you a chance maybe down in the low 80s or something like that, right? So every point into dex is going to boost that hit chance, um, and every point into strength is actually going to boost the zeal damage. Incidentally, if you're wondering why that damage is so pitiful, it is because you are not getting an accurate reading from the character stat sheet. Nowhere close, and I won't get into the details as to why, frankly, I don't even remember all of the reasons why offhand, but basically, you're just not seeing the appropriate damage calculated here in terms of how it actually manifests in the game. But yeah, so I actually have... 299, let's just round up and call it 300 points into Vitality, and I think that is about what you should aim for. And then if you want to put more into Vitality, Godspeed. But if you want to put more into Dex, 130, or Strength, 121, as I have, I think that's also great. And if you are especially not having survivability issues, which I personally don't, then you're maxing your character out better by putting points in a more unconventional way, in kind of these indeterminate amounts of extra strength and extra dexterity beyond the minimum. So it's kind of weird, right? In that while you're leveling most characters, especially casters, maybe you even throw a few early points into energy to make your life easier, and then you're, you're a little haphazard with a strength and dex, and then when you eventually respec, you're getting rid of all those extraneous points and pumping them all into vitality. With a Zealot Paladin, you actually need the vitality, ironically, more while you're leveling. And you need the other things, too. You kind of need everything, right? You need a lot of decks because attack rating's rough early. You need the strength, of course, to wear gear and do more damage. But by the time you're at the end game, it's almost like you, you need to respec less. Because no matter where you're putting your stats, unless it's in energy, they're doing something very useful for you. All right, friends, now on to the mercenary, and you'll have noticed by now that he's Act 5, and that is a controversial choice, and just to get something out of the way, I am not claiming that this is strictly better or even better overall than the classic Act 2 Might Merc. If you want to use the polearm guy from the desert, go for it. It's absolutely awesome alongside this Zealot build. So why am I using an Act 5 Merc? Well, I'll get into that, and I'll get into the unique advantages that he actually brings over the Act 2. Again, not claiming he's better on the whole, but he is definitely not strictly worse. But first, let's talk about the build itself. Of course, you do want a Frenzy Barb. They are just very, very powerful after the rework, and it of course gives you Lawbringer. That's where we need to start. It is by far the cheapest and by far the weakest overall item 
uh, from among the four items that he uses, but it is the reason this build works, and it's because it has a 20% chance to cast level 15 Decrepify on striking. In other words, it is how you break those physical immunities. The Lawbringer I have is a poor roll. I've made like four or five of them, and they're all poor rolls. Can't really complain because the rolls don't really matter, and I've gotten really lucky with other rolls on stuff where it actually matters a lot. The life percent stolen per hit I want to highlight because that actually only applies to the damage done with the offhand swing with Lawbringer, which is not much compared to the damage that he's doing with his main hand. So that life stolen per hit is actually not very relevant. Lawbringer boasts some nice bonuses to flat damage, which is part of why the base item, as long as it's a phase, bit, phase blade and the rolls really don't matter that much. Um, Slain Monsters resting in peace, Sanctuary Aura, these things are nice quality of life upgrades. And of course, a little bit of survivability between the defense versus missile and the life stolen per hit. Okay, great. But really, again, it's there as a Decrepify proc, and it will proc very often, given how frequently the Frenzy Barb is not only attacking, but connecting. But in the main hand is where the magic really happens, it's where all the damage is done. We're talking about Grief, this is an above average roll with plus 378 damage. And the attack speed, again, is kind of low, but much like on my main character, in the context, the full context of these builds, you don't need any more attack speed than you're already getting from any grief in a phase blade. And then beyond that, yeah, it's just a decent grief overall, and you cannot argue with grief. I talked all about that. If you need to know more about it, check out the previous video where I discussed gear at length. Now, just before I move off of the weapon talk, Ethereal upped socketed head striker is a very, very powerful option in the main hand damage dealing slot, and it's actually excellent. It's an excellent excellent option for just about any Act 5 Frenzy Barb Merc. And I did some diving into the increased attack speed calculators and just looked at the overall picture. And I think that grief, if you think it's better than head striker, which I think it just barely is, pairs best with Ariat's face, but if you're using Head Striker, I think Andariel's visage is probably the best helm. So I think the helm and the sword, what's best in slot, they kind of depend upon one another, but a big difference is the increased attack speed from Grief as well as the fast base attack speed of the Phase Blade compared to Head Striker being a lot slower of a weapon. Head Striker means you want the increased attack speed from Andariel's Visage, but if Andariel's Visage, if that attack speed is kind of wasted, then I think Ariat's face nudges ahead of it for the best in slot option. It allows us to throw a Cham in there as well for Cannot Be Frozen, whereas if you're using Andy's Visage, you might need fire resistance to offset the negative 30 that that brings. And beyond that, Ariat's face is just awesome. We have a very, very high roll ethereal option here that I upgraded and unfortunately did not roll well with the upgrade. It didn't get any worse, it got a little bit better, but it got nowhere near as much defense as I would have hoped. Having said that, it's still incredible. We've got two to combat skills and then a further two to all skills for barbs. 30% faster hit recovery, 20% bonus to attack rating, 6% life stolen per hit, and remember, that's very important because that's his main source of life steal with Lawbringers, plus 7, not really coming into play that much. Big enhanced defense roll, as I mentioned, 20 to strength, 20 to dex, all res 30, can't be frozen, ethereal, class specific, super, super cool. And then we've got fortitude for the armor, and I know a lot of people love treachery. That's another thing that may pair better if you're going with Andariel's visage. Since we're not, I think fortitude is the best option, and y you just can't go wrong with fortitude, right? This is a pretty good roll with 29 all res made in an ethereal Hellforge plate. Pretty cool stuff, if you ask me. So of course, once again with Grief, we're not getting the exact damage correct, but even in the character screen here, you can see the massive damage difference between Grief and 
Lawbringer, you've got nearly 14,000 for defense, a nice healthy life pool of 2,500 or thereabouts, and this is of course before Call to Arms buffs kicks in, well over capped on all resistances, and for advanced stats we've got a little bit of damage reduction, life replenishment, 75% extra gold from monsters definitely doesn't hurt our wallet, and as mentioned, some of these auras like Slain Monsters, Resting in Peace, and Level 16 Sanctuary, auras and effects I should say, they definitely help. So the Mercenary is very nice in terms of quality of life, and Cannot Be Frozen is very, very important, especially because I haven't yet talked about why I like using the Act 5 Merc rather than a more typical Act 2 choice. So remember, the way that the Zealot farms and the way that the Zealot fights, we don't have AoE. Yes, we attack everything around us with zeal, it's hitting kind of multiple targets with one click, but it's not true AoE, so we are not a good density farmer, even though we're very good at slugging it out with tough enemies, with elite packs, with bosses, and we're relatively mobile with charge and all that, we don't farm density all that well. And the Act 2 Merc, he's a little bit slow and he's a little bit derpy, so he's just amazing for just walking around and giving you an aura. That's the main reason they're good. But the Act 5 Frenzy Barb has better AI, is more aggressive, and he runs around cleaning up mobs all on his own. He's going around cutting down stragglers, he's running around hunting down cowards, and he's there slugging it out with the best of them against really tough enemies. So just the way that the Act 5 mercenary plays, the style of his aggression and of his speed, especially when frenzy stacks get built up, it actually suits the Zealot really, really well. You just have kind of two guys splitting it up, but doing the same type of thing while they're doing so. And again, not claiming it's better overall than the Act 2, but it is, an, at the very least, a viable alternative if you want to do something a little bit different. Now, as for the Paladin stats, let's take a quick look at those, not in terms of what to do with your base stats, but in terms of what it all looks like when we're fully geared and we have our Call to Arms buffs. We have a life pool approaching 2,500 Definitely not the biggest life pool you've ever seen, and thus engaging with the enemy is paramount. And that's why it's also nice to have those extra high resistance caps for stuff like Gloams and the Council and Travancall. It makes you more survivable as you close the distance with charge, and then once you start swinging with this grief and all the other great gear and great skills we've got and start life leeching, you're going to be just fine. But yeah, 2469 to be exact with this build for life, and again, it could be a fair amount more if you lean more into Vitality than I personally have done thus far. Um, you also have a mana pool of 375, and you might not think it matters that much, but charging does use up your mana pretty quick. That's why... Um, and, and Zeal uses a nominal amount of mana as well, but if you're not recharging it quickly, and you're not uh, mana leeching, which is why we need mana leech on the second raring slot, then you do definitely need a respectable mana pool, but whether or not you have those things in place, you've got to have a decent amount at least to charge around with, so thankfully we're able to do that without putting any points into energy. But if you look at our advanced stats, we're reducing damage by 7, magic damage by 15, and physical damage by 14%. All in all, that is a nice cluster of damage reduction, which for the same reasons I just mentioned in terms of overcapping the resistances, is very good to help you close the gap as a melee character with a relatively small health pool. We're stealing 8% life per hit. You can definitely have more. It might seem like you need more. I made the argument in the gear video that you actually don't, at least once you have this level of endgame gear. But we are stealing 8 life, 6 mana, 7 plus 7 replenish life, attacker taking damage of 10 from our just about perfect war travs, 134% extra gold from monsters that comes exclusively from Geeds. We've got just about 200 of magic item finding that is definitely decent. That's right around what I aim for in terms of characters that don't specialize in that or don't have 
special leeway in their gear to really crank that up. We've got experience bonus, of course, from the usual source, 14 to life after each kill. Um, what else is relevant? I don't want to read every single advanced stat. We've got well over capped, as I talked about in the gear video on increased attack speed. Only 25% faster run walk, but it definitely helps, again, alongside charge. 30% faster hit recovery, which is the minimum you should aim for. It is a breakpoint, and it comes exclusively from Guillaume's face. Personally, given our playstyle and how survivable we are and how much we block, I don't really think it's worth it to do the extra 18% or maybe 15, I think it's 18, to get that next level of faster hit recovery, because that has to come from your charms, and I would rather have more damage coming from my charms, having played this character quite a bit. Of course, ignoring target's defense is amazing, and 20, minus 25 target defense, also amazing. 12% of our damage taken goes to mana. We've got prevent monster heal. We are a certified demon hunter, plus 5, 20, 6 percent damage to demons, attacker taking lightning damage of 15, 35 percent crushing blow, 70 percent deadly strike. Those are perhaps the single two most important statistics from among all the ones I just read. Two to mana after a kill, plus 16 fire absorb, plus 20 percent cold absorb, cannot be frozen, and then, just for show, stuff like slower stamina drain and penalties to enemy fire and poison resistance. I'm not sure whether I covered this in the gear video, I don't believe I did, but just for the sake of completion, Call to Arms and Spirit are on swap, of course, Spirit for the plus skills, and you might as well make it in a Paladin shield, it'd be kind of weird not to, right? And it doesn't really matter, nothing on it really matters so much, um, so don't break the bank for a perfect paladin spirit or anything. And Call to Arms, I just have a simple 442. It's not as good as the CTA on my Windy Druid. I didn't break the bank on it. Frankly, the character doesn't seem to need Call to Arms all that much, which is kind of ironic, because the life pool is astonishingly small without it. 1652 without the CTA buffs active. But, you know, it really just goes to show the power of Zealing and the power of all of this gear. Of course, if you are looking for an endgame character, you do want something great in that swap slot. You could maybe swap to something with Magic Find or a Demon Limb or something like that, but to me, a nice, decent CTA is pretty clearly the way to go. So there you go, guys. I hope I covered everything between the preceding video and this one that you were curious about. But of course, if you have any further questions about the Fanatic Zealot Paladin, leave them, of course, in the comments below. And give us a thumbs up, subscribe, all that good stuff if you've not already done so. If you choose to support this content, my family and I appreciate that greatly. That's in the link below at Patreon. And I will see you for the third and final video in this series very soon, where we'll take this guy through all kinds of different areas and player counts. Thank you, as always, for watching, and I will talk to you soon.